what you don't want to hear in the cloud forest is the sound of a leopard. And these make a kind of sound like the sawing of wood, a kind of... <laughs> and if, if you hear one of those close by, you've got a choice. You, you can just faint or you can run. Our natural world inspires and shapes us, so it's critical that we work to protect it. I'm Alex Honnold, professional rock climber and founder of the Honnold Foundation, and this is season two of Planet Visionaries. As a climber, I've been fortunate enough to see both the beauty and fragility of our planet. That's why I'm proud to be joining Rolex and the Washington Post Creative Group to bring you stories of inspiring people who are helping solve some of the most important conservation issues that we face today. On this episode, I get to talk with Rowan Pethiagoda, a Sri Lankan conservationist who's devoted decades to preserving his home's unique highland ecosystem. He's helped protect biodiversity in his country and fund essential research. Rowan, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Alex. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's start with how you got interested in conservation. My dad used to be a trout fisherman, and as a little boy of five or six, I'd, I'd go trout fishing with him. It gave me a chance to get in the water and, and mess about with fish and slugs and aquatic life. And I had this fascination for species from a very early age. I, I always was trying to tease them apart and identify what made species different. And I didn't know there was a science associated with this yearning until much later, the fact that this diversity, the difference between life forms existed. And this this always fascinated me, and it still fascinates me to this day. So how old were you when you were discovering new species of fish, basically? Uh, I, I think I discovered my first new species when I was still uh, high school, but I didn't know it then. I couldn't prove it then. It was it was only much later that I could, because I couldn't pursue my studies in biology for the simple reason that my my dad didn't believe that uh, a biologist was a kind of living that anyone should be making. You couldn't make a living as a biologist, so I had to be either an engineer or a lawyer or a doctor or something like this. And so I went off and became a biomedical engineer. But unlike you, I didn't have uh, the wit to drop out. <laughs> And, and follow my calling. So I worked as a biomedical engineer for a good long time, uh, seven years, and, and then I, I quit and, and started following my, my dream of being a biologist. Can you describe what growing up as a boy in Sri Lanka was like? So my dad was uh, the manager of a tea garden in the central highlands of Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka is a small island about the size, I think, of West Virginia. And in the middle of Sri Lanka, these mountains that rise to about 2,500 meters. And these mountains have almost completely been deforested now for the plantation of tea, because Ceylon uh, or Sri Lankan tea has been uh, famous throughout the world for a long time. And so the, the highlands that you're describing, what are they like? So they're rolling hills that are now carpeted in an ocean of tea shrubs or bushes. But a century ago, these were what we call tropical montane cloud forests. And the special thing about cloud forests is that whenever you get a a massif of mountains uh, close to the sea in the tropics, the wind that blows in, the moist air, tends to get swept up as it hits the face of the massif. And as the air rises, it cools and water condenses into cloud or, or mist or fog. And so these forests tend to be drenched in mist pretty much all the time. And as a result of that, they tend to be perpetually wet and have a flora and a fauna and plants and animals that are particularly adapted to life in this really bizarre climate. I, I saw somewhere that you'd been to a cloud forest in Guyana, I think it was. And so I, I think you, you know that this is just like living in a sponge that's wet. And so the level of endemism that the plants and animals that you find just in these specialized forests and nowhere else in the the world are quite special. Yeah, that's exactly the experience we had in Guyana, where uh, we discovered several new species of frog and and lizard and uh, exact same sort of thing, you know, species new to science. So describe the sensations of being in a cloud forest like that. You say that everything's perpetually wet, but like, what does that actually feel like when you're when you're traveling through the forest? It's good to have a spare pair of socks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
but it, it really is a wonderful sensation because the cloud forest tends to be a, a dwarf. They, they sometimes call, call it an elfin forest because the, the trees are so short, rarely more than about 25 or 30 feet tall. And the branches are gnarled and festooned with, with bryophytes, with liverworts and mosses and filmy ferns. It looks all very eerie and mysterious, especially because very little light gets into the cloud forest because it's shrouded in mist. Um, so everything's rather eerie. It's, it's, it's like something out of a, a movie that you're going to lose sleep about at night. <laughs> That's exactly. Our experience in Guyana, the, we sort of had to commute through the, the cloud forest to get to the base of the wall that we were trying to climb. And we were calling it the slime forest because, as you said, everything's festooned. You know, it's like covered in life, like other other creatures living on the trees and the plants. And everything is so wet and slimy. And and the whole thing had an evil feel to it. Like, it's just such difficult terrain and it's so wet and there's so much life. Like, it, it felt like an evil swamp in, in, a, in a bad movie. I was like, it's, it is honestly maybe one of the most difficult places that I've ever traveled by foot. Exactly. But the irony is that there's so little of it left. I think the surviving amount of cloud forest in the world now is about 250,000 square kilometers. That's about half the size of France. Um, so there's about as much cloud forest left in the world as there is coral reef. And, and we know that mm. there's very little of that. So this, this is a very precious and, and vulnerable habitat. I think that for someone who hasn't been to a rainforest or a cloud forest, it's hard to describe just how loud and how alive and teeming with life. I mean, you know, my experience with, with the rainforest is just that everything was so much louder, total cacophony. So we've got this environment in the cloud forest that is built on sound because animals are trying to locate each other through sound because there's very little vision you can have in there. It's dark to start with and it's very thickly overgrown. And so the, the first thing that strikes you, I think, about a Sri Lankan cloud forest is the call of dozens of species of frogs. I think 15 is the maximum number of species I've found within earshot of any one place. And each frog's got a unique call. And in addition to the frogs, you've got the cicadas who are making an almighty racket. What you don't want to hear in the cloud forest is the sound of a leopard. And these make a kind of sound like the sawing of wood, a kind of... <laughs> and if, if you hear one of those close by, you've got a choice. You, you can just faint or you can run. <laughs> An important part of Rohan's groundbreaking conservation work is his inclusion of the Sri Lankan people, language, and culture. Tell me about your first projects identifying the different species in Sri Lanka. I published a book in 1991 on the freshwater fishes of Sri Lanka, and I think it was the first book anywhere in the world that provided color pictures, color photographs of pretty much all the fish in that country. And then we started publishing books in local languages. This had never been done before on birds and frogs and reptiles, amphibians and so on. So it puts information in the hands of people who otherwise didn't have access to information because of a uh, difficulty in language. Uh, because I think it's less than 5% of the Sri Lankan population that speaks English. So this was quite a revolution in its time. Do you see a result of that? Like, do you wind up with more young Sri Lankans interested in conservation or working on the projects or studying biodiversity? Yeah, I, I feel quite quite inadequate now when I meet up with these young people because they've, they've seen a lot more than I've seen. And so it's very humbling to meet these people in their 20s now who are, who are experts in, in fields that I couldn't have dreamt of. It's very satisfying. Is the environment culturally important to Sri Lanka? Yeah, I think we're very lucky in that. Um, Sri Lanka is a Buddhist country, and Buddhism has this reverence for life, which is deeply ingrained. The first tenet of Buddhism is, thou shalt not kill. So Buddhists are very, very conscious of the fact that life needs to be preserved and protected. So even now, I think the kind of environmental problems that many other countries in Sri Lanka's economic stratum face are not faced in Sri Lanka. So 
What are the threats facing the cloud forest in Sri Lanka? On the one hand, we have the human problems, which is Sri Lankans who are poor and who need access to energy going and cutting down trees for firewood. This, this is a common problem. And those are the poorest of the poor, and no one's going to go and turf them out of, of, of a livelihood. So, so I, I think there is a kind of dichotomy there. Everyone subscribes to the view that you shouldn't cut down the forest, but then when very poor people do that, it's very difficult to object as well. Yeah, as I've always said in interviews, it's like, what's the point in supporting environmental projects that don't also help the communities nearby? Because Exactly. Yeah, it's like nobody cares about the environment unless all their basic needs are met. Yes, exactly. And the other side is the natural problem of climate change. Rainfall in Sri Lanka's highlands has fallen by about 20% in the last century, and cloud forests are very dependent on rain. The other problem is that because the surrounding landscape has been deforested, for some reason that we don't understand, this results in the cloud table rising. So the cloud that used to pass through the cloud forest canopy and keep the forest wet has now risen, and so the trees can't extract water from the cloud that passes through. So this is leading to stress of the forest, and we've got vast extents of just clumps of trees just dying where they stand. And we don't know quite what to do about it. Yeah, that's that's a hard thing to, to manage. If the cloud doesn't come to the cloud forest, what do you do to protect the forest? Exactly. It's terrible to see because about 20% of the cloud forest is now affected by this dieback phenomenon. When did you start focusing on trying to preserve the cloud forests? So because I grew up in this, what used to be a cloud forest environment, I'd always thought about what it must have been like before all the forests were cut down to make way for these tea gardens. And so I wanted to find out whether a tea plantation could be turned back into cloud forest. So in 1998, I bought a a small piece of land, 50 acres, and we started trekking how forest could be restored on this land. So we had to do things like getting rid of invasive species, deciding what to do with the tea that was growing on that land before, uh, and so on. So this this became quite an adventure. And that project is, is now 24 years old. I read something that you guys plant shade trees to basically shade out the non-native species. Yeah, this is a problem. If you cut down an an area of forest anywhere in the highlands, it's very rapidly colonized by these really aggressive garden plants. So we had to plant shade trees that would grow quickly and shade out the invasive plants. We also tried the do-nothing intervention, which which seems to be the most successful really in the long term, which which is good news. If you do nothing, those... Alien invasive plants tend tend to be overcome by native vegetation in the 20-year term, maybe, very slowly. It's sort of counterintuitive to to embrace the do-nothing approach and just know that in several decades, nature will sort itself out. But it's great to know that the do-nothing works. That's, that's fantastic news. And it took us 20 years to learn that. So I'm glad we know it, because now when we do this somewhere else, we know that a do-nothing approach might also be the best way to go about it. Is it wrong to let the garden plants take over a plot of land? And, and I ask that because my yard right now is basically being overtaken by weeds. And my family is like, oh, pull the weeds. And I'm always like, you know, they're alive. It's like there are bees out there, there are birds in them. It's like, do I really want to kill life? And I live in a desert, so basically any life is, is sort of precious. I get asked that a lot. And the reason it's bad in our context in Sri Lanka is because of the the competition that they'd offer to the native flora. The forest itself, the vegetation, the species of trees and shrubs take a very long time to become established. I suspect it's going to take three or four centuries. Is it hard to stay motivated for this conservation work, knowing that you won't really see results for potentially centuries? In a funny sort of way, I don't feel threatened by that. I'm gratified that other people have stepped in to provide continuity to this project, I, I just wish I'd started it when I was younger, but I no, I don't feel worried that it's a long-term project. You say that, and yet I've never heard of anybody talk about a, a project that they expect to take centuries. You know, and and for this podcast, I've interviewed a lot of interesting scientists working on you know long-term projects, 
but nobody's ever really said that it's going to take potentially hundreds of years for their work to play out. Oh, I, I don't know, Alex. I, I think the difficulty we all have as humans is coming to grips with our mortality. But once you've sorted that out, I, I think a long-term project is something that we are quite used to doing. Every time you plant a tree, for example, you can be pretty sure if you plant an oak tree, you're not going to see that as a fully fully grown oak, but it's, it's going to happen one day. And I think you look forward to the fact that it'll, it'll happen, otherwise you wouldn't plant it. Yeah, actually, I suppose having children is much the same. I just had, uh, just had a daughter. And like, I suppose that is sort of a project that will exceed your lifetime, hopefully. She is your claim to immortality, my friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right now, she's just my claim to a uh, lack of sleep. But. <laughs> yes. Winning the Rolex Awards for Enterprise brought Rohan's work a new level of recognition and credibility. So you were named a Rolex Awards for Enterprise Laureate in 2000. What did that do for your work and, and how did you feel when you found out? Rolex was the first award I ever won. And it was the most important one because I was out in the field one day and this was still in the days of landlines and someone said, there's, there's a call for you. And I was told by my wife that I'd just got a letter from Rolex saying that they'd given me this award. And I was very excited, very humbled because... One never thinks when working in a, in a remote place like Sri Lanka that anyone else is uh, watching what you're doing or, or even cares what you're doing. So this came as, as a wonderful awakening, a, a lovely reward. It enabled me for the first time to get recognized, my, my opinions on conservation, for example, to be recognized because Rolex carries this brand name with it that everyone recognizes. I think everyone pretty much on the planet uh, knows what Rolex is. Did that platform wind up helping your work? I mean, to, to this day now, 22 years later, I, I meet people for the first time and they say, oh, you're the Rolex guy. And so that makes it easy for me to get a word in when otherwise my words might not have had as much traction. So I've found that opportunity to be absolutely fantastic. And now I had a platform from which to do conservation, from which to attract funding for other people's projects, and, and so on. So, so it was a, a huge opportunity. So what are some of the benefits of being part of the Rolex Awards for Enterprise Community? The profiles of the the people who have been award winners all go up on the Rolex site. And, and this this is a terrifying experience because when you look at some of these people and the projects they're doing, they're just completely awesome. And I, I just feel like, you know, I'm scratching the surface in some little corner of the planet when people are doing some really crazy things, checking out the ecology of penguins in, in, uh, on Antarctica and doing, doing some really beautiful projects. But I think the recognition that Rolex gives each one of its laureates is such that it gives them a platform, gives us a platform from which to work in our own communities. It raises our profile to a place where we get heard more easily. And certainly in my case, that, that was it. Rohan may not live to see the full effect of his work in Sri Lanka's cloud forests, but according to him, that's the point. What do you see as the future of your work over the next few years? And what do you hope that the impact of your work is? So in, in the long term, I had a plan that the, the impact of my work would be the students I've helped and trained. I see them in many ways as my legacy. I really see it in, in a kind of parenthood. If you've brought a generation of people who are thinking wonderful thoughts and doing wonderful work, and, and they continue doing the thing that you started. So even though the individuals change, I think the ideas live on. And, and that, to me, is what it's all about. That's such a fragile impact, though, in a way. I mean, it's not a monumental impact, if, if that's what you mean. But I, I think the fact that you leave a legacy of achievement amongst yourselves and other people, it's, it's like, I, I don't know, that like when you do something important for the first time, I, I think it's really important to, to the world in general. It, it doesn't need a monument to remember it by. The fact that you've climbed El Capitan, you know, this is a, a mountain standing at the foot of which I was feeling nervous, let alone the top of it. <laughs> and the fact that you climbed this without a rope is something that just astonishes me. To, to even talk about it makes my palms sweat. I don't know why. 
<laughs> that's that's fair. That's fair. So, what advice would you give to somebody who's interested in doing similar work to you? My advice to young people who want to be involved in conservation is start doing it young, and and try and find things that other people aren't interested in. The go-to place in, for example, for people who like animals is, is bird watching. But very few people devote time to insects or fungi or algae. So focus on, on things that other people are, are neglecting. I've often said something similar because with, with climbing, it's much the same. If you want to have any kind of impact, you just go to the fringe, you know, go to the places that other people aren't going, like do sure. the things that other people aren't willing to do. What advice would you give to the average person about how they can help keep the planet perpetual? I think it's a question of staying in touch with nature. And this is something that I think people can pay more and more attention to doing. Because whether it's camping or hiking, or climbing, bird watching, fish keeping, I don't know, surfing, diving, snorkeling, all these <laughs> activities really keep us with our finger on the pulse of nature. And I think that's Wonderful. Even gardening, I think, is, is hugely important uh, as, uh, as a pursuit that keeps you in touch with nature. So outdoor recreational activity, I think, is the thing that we can use as a proxy for uh, a love for nature and a love for the environment. That was noted Sri Lankan conservationist Rohan Pethiagoda. I'm Alex Honnold. Thanks for listening to Planet Visionaries. If you enjoyed what you heard, please like, subscribe, and leave a review to help others find it. On the next episode, I'll be joined by biologist Thomas Young, whose pioneering conservation work is helping to save turtles across Africa. And if you liked this episode, check out season one, episode six, where we spoke to Topher White, an engineer capturing sounds in the rainforest to help prevent deforestation. Thanks for listening, and check out the next generation of environmental innovators at rolex.org. Thank you.